Well, I'd like to welcome our viewing audience today, those of you who are online watching us. We appreciate you joining us right here in Corpus Christi. And uh, those of you who are in the Coastal Bend, Kingsville, Alice, and all those towns in the Coastal Bend, thank you so much for joining us. Happy Resurrection Sunday to you all. Amen. And I would like to also welcome our brothers and sisters from around the world. Uh, in, uh, those of you who are in Asia and Africa, Europe, here in North America, Central America, South America, Australia, and the islands of the sea, thank you so much. And this is Resurrection Day. I know around the world the church has uh, been calling this for a long, long, long time now, Easter. But I would like to just correct that today and just say that this is about Jesus and not the Easter Bunny. Yeah. So thank you so much. And I, and I would really like to implore you, and all, of, all of you, implore you, beg you, beseech you, to let us call it what it is. Uh, because our lives were changed that day Jesus got out of the grave. It was the, a prophetic thing that, that happened. Yes, it was real and actual, but it was also prophetic. That means that God was saying to all those who are in Christ, you're going to have a resurrection just like his. Yes. Amen. Amen. So thank you so much for having joined us today. So good to see all of you. Some of you are already standing ready to go. So uh, those of you who can stand, uh, don't worry about it if you cannot. Uh, but those of us who can, let's start out together. And we want to just bless the Lord. Uh, uh, let's take a moment just to bless the Lord. Father, thank you so much for who you are and what you have done. Thank you for your blessedness. Thank you for this amazing day. Thank you that we celebrate. We celebrate you, Jesus, that you got out of the grave that day by the very power of God. It is so amazing. You got out of the grave and you walked around and you did amazing things. You did amazing things for 40 days you stayed on the earth after being resurrected. A resurrected man was on the grave, was on the earth for 40 days, getting out of the grave by his own power, as it were, the power of God. Thank you so much, Jesus, for what you've done for us. And as the song says, Jesus, I will never forget what you have done for me. And let us all say that to you, Lord, every day that we will never forget. Thank you so much for your amazing sacrifice. And may you be fully, fully realized in every life that is here today and those who are online as well. In your name, Jesus, we pray. Thank you. Amen. Amen. Sister Stephanie. Amen. Thank you. Let's worship our resurrected Savior. He's alive. Thank you, Jesus. Now 
Bring your additions. Come lay them down at the foot of the cross. Jesus is waiting. God so loved the world. Let's sing that again. So bring your, your failures. Bring your additions. Come lay them down at the foot of the cross. Jesus is waiting, God so loved the world. Come to the altar, the Father. Arms are open, 
my cross you bore so I could live in the freedom you died for and now my life is yours and I will sing of your goodness forever
worthy Lamb, the Lamb of God, to the praise the glory to the Lamb of God, we sing glory to the Lamb. Father, we cry glory to the Lamb of God because He is the one who has taken away the sin of the world. It is so mind-boggling and overwhelming even to our spirit man that one person is able to take on all of the sin of humanity from beginning to end. But that's how mighty you are. Sin has weight. How could one person endure that weight? It is difficult for even a, a single one of us to deal with the weight of our own personal sin. But Jesus, you took up all of our sin upon yourself. That's why we sing glory to the Lamb. We sing glory to the Lamb of God. It was the Lamb who was slain. Thank you, O Lamb of God. Thank you for who you are and what you have done. Thank you for being so mighty. Thank you for being so loving and kind. We bless your name. We worship you. Thank you, Jesus, our healer and our healing. Thank you, Jesus. So as a result of who you are and what you have done, we pray today. We pray for all who are in this house and all who are watching online. For you have said to us, I am the Lord who heals you. Thank you for healing everybody under the sound of my voice. Thank you for being mindful of everyone. Thank you for promising to fulfill the number of our days. Thank you for taking on yourself our infirmities and bearing our sicknesses. Thank you, Jesus, for every mighty act you have performed and the love that you are. Thank you, Jesus. We ask you to bless fathers and mothers, sons and daughters. We ask that those who are lost you will find for you said in your word that you came to save, to seek and save the lost. Thank you, your mighty Savior. So today, on this Resurrection Day, on this Resurrection Sunday, we ask you to seek and to save those who are lost. In your great name, Jesus, do it, we pray. Do it because you are Jehovah Rapha. Do it because you are Jehovah Rohi. You are the Lord our healer and you are the Lord our shepherd. So we thank you so much for hearing our prayer and answering our prayer on behalf of those who are here. We ask you, Lord God, to remember George and Mildred as they are recovering and being attended to. Heal George and Mildred, husband and wife, in different hospitals this morning. They woke up in different hospitals, suffering in their bodies. I ask you to heal them. You said, ask. I will have asked. 
heal George and Mill. Comfort their children in Jesus' name. We thank you for Michelle and ask you, Lord God, to heal her of this cancer that seems to be spreading through her body. We ask that you would arrest it, stop it, and give her a clean bill of health. We ask you to heal Jim, who is dealing with cancer. We ask you to heal everybody who's dealing with cancer. Whether they know it or not, heal them in Jesus' name. We thank you for Raul, whose heart is failing him, and we ask you to pray for his family. Pray for them. We ask you rather to heal their family as we pray for them. We thank you, Jesus. And Lord, take care of Teresa. She needs you right now. Teresa needs you. Help her. Comfort her. Encourage her. In the name of the Lord. In the name of the Lord. Lord, thank you. In the name of Jesus Christ. And Lord God, while we're praying for our situations and the situations of our loved ones, we pray for our nation. We ask you on this resurrection morning that you would give us another opportunity to do things right and correct. Heal this nation by healing her people. Cause the church of Jesus to rise up and be the salt and the light that you have declared we are. Cause us to shine brightly as that city on a hill that cannot be hidden. And lastly, I ask you, Jesus, lastly, I ask you that you would cause us to realize who we are and that all of us as born again, blood washed believers would take our place, would know our place and take our place in society. Help us on this resurrection day in your name, Jesus, amen, 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 amen. You may be seated as Sister Jadira Ulick comes. The power of his resurrection. And with great power, the apostles gave witness to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus and great grace was upon them all the angel answered and said to the women do not be afraid for I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified he is not here for he is risen as he said the words he has risen as he said informed a group of men and women to such an extent that they became the most formidable people to ever have lived on planet earth. These believers in Jesus Christ with an unprecedented boldness changed the world. Therefore, it is incumbent on us, their children, to be no less than they in making an indelible mark upon our generation. How is this done? It is accomplished through the preaching of the cross of Christ and living out its reality. Three days after the crucifixion may have seemed like just another day to most people in Jerusalem, but it was not. This day marked one of the two most significant days in human history. One being Jesus' birth and the second, his death and resurrection. Jesus rose from the dead. He was and is the very first man to do so, which means that he, though human like us, must also be different. He, by the power of his resurrection, is now and forever declared to be the Son of God with power, power over death and the grave. Never before in human history had anything like this occurred on this planet. From that moment, everything changed on earth. 
Humanity has been on a different trajectory, some toward eternity with God and the others toward an eternity without him. The knowledge of his resurrection is meant specifically to change your trajectory. And as believers, we must realize that the doctrine of the resurrection is essential and one of the most important doctrines in the Bible. We must give it the attention it deserves because it is one of the cornerstones of our faith. If Jesus did not rise from the dead, then all we do in life is empty and we are still in our sins. The power of his resurrection is able to change your forever. Today is the day of your salvation, Pastor Don. some more praise. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. What a wonderful day. What a wonderful day that we're in. Not just this day, but the day that this symbolizes what took place so many years ago. What an amazing thing. As we just heard in the article, let us never forget that. Let us never forget what was done for us. The power that we have because of our Savior. Because He overcame death and the grave and is victorious. And we are in His life as well. Amen? Amen. What a wonderful day. What a wonderful thing. What a wonderful Savior. Let's give Him some praise. Thank you, Jesus. My name is Jackson Lindsay. I'm the pastor of the youth here at the fellowship. And it is so good to see each and every single one of you. Thank you so much for being here. If you would take a second, turn to somebody sitting next to you and say, It is good to see you this morning. Now turn to somebody else and tell them, you look good in the house of the Lord. At this time, we'd like to greet anybody that is with us for the very first time. You may be a first time guest with us. If you wouldn't mind just waving at me, if you could just wave your hand in the air. Good morning. Good to see you. Good morning. I see you back there. Anybody over here on this side that I missed? I see you. Yes. Thank you very much. Uh, and right here, right up front, I missed you too. Hey, thank you so much for being here. Uh, right now, our ushers are going to be bringing you an information card. And uh, Brother Brian, right up here up front. Um, they're bringing you an information card. It's got basic information on there. We just want to get to know you a little bit more, see if there's anything that we can do for you, see if there's any prayer requests you may have that we can pray over. Uh, we pray over prayer requests daily as a staff. Anything that you uh, call into the office and give us or text into our prayer request line, we pray over it daily. And uh, let us know when the Lord answers your prayer, because we continue to pray and pray and pray. And when you let us know how the Lord answered your prayer, it gives us, emboldens our faith, strengthens us, and then we can bring glory to God and say, when we pray, He answers. Amen? Amen. Well, we also want to welcome our internet audience. Thank you for joining us this morning. If this is your first time, if you wouldn't mind in the chat below, just leaving a comment and our moderator will reach out to you and get your information and your prayer requests as well. Uh, we're going to move into our offering time, into our giving time now. So if you need an off, amen, yes. If you need an offering envelope, you can raise your hand and our ushers will give you one. If you're giving by cash, this is how you'll get record of your gift. If you're giving by check, all of your information is on your check, so you don't necessarily need an envelope. Uh, but if you would like one, you still can use one to allocate the specific place you want your check to go to. You can also give online if you go to cccfellowship.com forward slash give. And you can also text your gift. The number is on the screen. All you have to do is send the word keywords to that number, and it will direct you through the process. Amen. 
All right. Well, we didn't have any announcements today. We have announcements. We didn't play any announcements because the only announcement that matters is he is not here. He is risen, as he said. So let me pray for you, and then you'll be in the hands of the ushers. Father, we thank you so much. We thank you so, so much, Jesus. Lord, as we heard it said, the two most important days was your birth and your resurrection. But every day of your life was important. If you weren't born, there would not have been a resurrection. If you had not lived a sinless life every minute of the day, there would have been no resurrection. And because of your resurrection, we have one. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, our wonderful and beautiful Savior. We give out of that grateful heart for what you've done. We don't give out of obligation. We don't give, as it were, by force. We give out of love and out of worship. We give what we have to give, and we ask that you would take these loaves and these fishes and that you would multiply it and feed the multitudes on this planet. In Jesus' name I pray. In the mighty name of Jesus I pray. Amen. Away my sin. But the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again?
Amen. Amen. Wow, it's the blood. Sinless blood. That's just so amazing. Jesus is just amazing to me. He is amazing to me that someone can come to this earth, live a sinless life, resurrect from the grave, ascend to heaven, and then save a bunch of bad people. Just a bunch of them. This is amazing. And not only save us, but keep us. Somebody asked the question, well, can the saved be lost? And this pastor's answer was, well, it depends on who saves them. Amen. Amen. Welcome, welcome to this service today. Amen. Such a, such a powerful praise and worship. Thank you, Sister Stephanie, wherever you are. Thank you. Thank you oh, so for leading us. We appreciate your leadership. Thank you. And I have to do something that's may, maybe it's essential. It's essential. Um, happy birthday to Raylan Durrell, who loves Jesus more than perhaps anybody on that row. Hey, happy birthday, Raylan. <laughs> okay. Well, anybody that's this side of you. All right. Happy birthday. On Resurrection Sunday. Yesterday? Well, that's close. That's close. Well, happy birthday, Raylan. And also, um, our sister, Miss Elsa Brown. Where is she? Yes, happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Wow. So, I have, I have no opportunity to have my birthday on Resurrection Sunday. It's in August. <laughs> but boy, this is beautiful. This is beautiful. Happy, happy birthday, happy Resurrection Sunday. Listen, let me just get started. Um, number one, I'm, I'm grateful that you are here, and thank you so much for being here. Um, I, I want to just talk a little bit about the resurrection, Christ's resurrection. I don't have to whip myself up. I'm just excited that God saved me. Yeah. yeah. I am excited. When you realize that he did not have to save you, but he chose you. Salvation is one of, those, one of those things that it's sometimes hard to explain because you are involved, but not as much as you think. You know, God chose us, and I'm excited about that his choice of me. Somebody might say, well, that's unfair. It's not unfair when you own everything and you decide what you're going to do with what you own. It's not unfair. Let's talk about the resurrection a little while because I want the resurrection, I want it to inform us to such a degree that the power of God has taken us over, as it were, and that we are so dedicated to Jesus and what he wants that our agenda is secondary, or maybe even tertiary. It's not just the second, it's perhaps third on the list. I titled this message, Christ's Resurrection Vi Victory, and, and I put in parentheses under that the guarantee. I would like for us to know that when you come to Jesus and you give him all that you are, he keeps you. He takes you and he keeps you. And it's not possible for the enemy to upend you, to take you from God. If the enemy could, and that, I know that's a, a presumption of so many believers. It's a presumption that the enemy somehow has authority or ability to deceive you from the God who chose you. I find that an impossible thing. I get into trouble for saying that because some people think that that's blasphemy. That's wrong. It's a wrong understanding of Scripture. But today we are celebrating Jesus 
victory over the grave, which was an impossible thing before Jesus came. Everybody who lived died. Jesus is my hero. He is our hero. And he has guaranteed that death will not defeat you. Amen. Death Amen. will not defeat you. The grave will not defeat you. Hell will not have you because you have been born of God. The resurrection of Jesus Christ is the very core of our faith. As, as several have said, if Jesus had not risen from the grave, you and I would still be in our sins. We would be eternally lost. It is not only, as it were, the, at the core of our faith, but it's indispensable to our faith. It can never, ever be minimized. If Christ did not rise from the dead, our faith is totally empty, and it is vain to think or believe in any of the scriptures. We might as well throw it all away. But we know that he did rise from the grave. And this is how you know. Not just because it's a, a historical fact. That's great. But you and I know that Jesus Christ rose from the grave because he gave us his spirit as an inner witness that he did experience a bodily resurrection. The Holy Spirit is our witness. I of, I've said in the past, often more than I do, do these days, that so often when I am reading the Word of God or someone is teaching or talking about something in Scripture, it's as though I had a front row seat to it. Sometimes it's so real, I, I almost, as it were, shake myself to say, don't become overly emotional. That is the Holy Spirit. He gives us witness. Somebody might be here today and you say, well, I don't have that witness. Well, perhaps you don't have the Holy Spirit. That's not a, a condemning statement, but you can receive the Holy Spirit. And the amazing thing about the Holy Spirit is that when we believe what God has testified of, he will give us the Holy Spirit. That is, we believe in his son. Amen. In, in Corinth, there were people there who did not believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And they called themselves believers, but they did not believe in the bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ. So Paul is, presents, in this text that I'm going to read today, he presents three proofs to assure his readers that Jesus Christ indeed had been raised from the dead. See, being raised from the dead was just as it were, unbelievable, because nobody had done it. And, and some people thought impossible. Even some of those who walked with Jesus had wondered, is he really, I don't believe he's, he's uh, risen from the dead because I saw him die on the cross. They didn't understand it. So let's look at the reality of our faith in the risen Christ. Our, the reality of our faith is in the risen Christ. You know, in this church, we always talk about Jesus Christ. We're always talking about who he is, what he's done, and what he has done cannot be undone. That's not always heard. And there are people who don't know that Jesus can keep you from all of our mess-ups and our proclivities to do wrong. Here in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, I'm going to start in the first verse, and we will sort of hurry along and get as much of it said as possible. Paul says, moreover, brethren, I declare to you the gospel which I preach to you, which also you receive. You receive the good news, the gospel that I preach to you, which you also received and in which you stand, by which also you are saved. Right? So this is what Paul wants, to, wants us to understand. Actually, he wanted the Corinthians to understand, and we understand it as well, that you and I are saved by the preaching of the gospel. He says, if you hold fast that word which I preach to you, unless you believe in vain. And so that this is some, for some people, the caveat where they'll say, ah, ah, see there? It says you can believe in vain. 
But, but this is what that means. It means that there are people who believe in the sense that they give mental assent. They give mental assent. And so what Paul is saying, uh, that you and I do not have a salvation from mental assent. Mental assent is not biblical faith. So you don't just say, yeah, that sounds plausible. Let's do it. No. You know, the scripture says, you believe that there is one God, you do well. Even the demons believe and tremble. So the demons do not have saving faith. The, the demons have mental assent. They agree that Jesus, that Jesus is God. They agree, they agree with that, but it does not save them. Assent means to comply with, give in to, or I did as I was told. So there are some people who, who they say they're safe. They just did what they're told. Raise your hand. Repeat after me. Blah, blah, blah. And so, but that is not where we are. Everyone in our sphere of influence should know who we are, whose we are, and why we are. Now, what does that mean? The scripture teaches us that we are a chosen generation. We are a royal priesthood. We are a holy nation. We are his own special people. Why? That we may proclaim the praises of him who called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. So we are a people group now, the people of God. The scripture says, who, were, who once were not a people. We were not a people. We were scattered. But now we are the people of God. There was, we are the people of God. So we are a people group. And the Holy Spirit declares that we are now a nation. That's a mind-blowing thing. Do you consider yourself, I belong to the nation of God. And so because of Jesus and because of his resurrection, you are now a part of the nation of God, the people of God, who had not obtained mercy, but now you have obtained mercy. Amen. Amen. So, so this day is very important to our, our life. It's important to our success. It's important to who we were. The gospel is the most important message that the church has ever proclaimed or could ever proclaim. The gospel, the good news that Jesus Christ came, that Jesus Christ lived a sinless life, that he died a, a death that was not his. Because the soul that sins shall die. So what Jesus did, he said, that I will take the sin of the whole world upon me and uh, I will die for everybody. And because the sin, or the sin that he took upon him was not his own, therefore the grave could not hold him. Jesus took our sin, went into death, and left it there. Left it there. Get out of the grave. That's what God has done for us. The gospel is good news. It's not bad news. It wouldn't be good news if Jesus could only save me for a few months or a few years. It would not be good news. It would be bad news. So, but the gospel is good news. And so you tell all those naysayers that the gospel is good news. All those people who believe that, that somehow you were saved for a little while and you're going to be lost forever, just show them the cross. Talk about the empty grave. Talk about the empty grave. It is, you know, it's good to be involved in, in some social actions uh, for the betterment of mankind. It's good to be uh, involved in some of those things. Uh, there's no reason why these Im involvements, however, should preempt the gospel. Why? Paul tells us that Christ died. I'm going to read it in a moment. Christ died. He died for us. He died as us. He was buried. I mean, that means put in the, the tomb, in the grave. He rose again. All right? And he was seen. These are the basic facts or historical facts of the gospel. And we must be firm in our proclamation. I know that people will say, some of them will say, oh, you're an ignorant person. You say, well, ignorance pr primarily means that I'm unaware of something. So I think that if I am ignorant because I believe in what I know and you don't believe in what you don't know, you are the ignorant person. I don't know if we should say that, but it might feel good for a moment. First Corinthians chapter 15 verse 3 bears out what I just read. 
Paul says to the Corinthians, because they were believing that there was no bodily resurrection. So I want to try to get to this, the meat of this. Verse 3 says, For I deliver to you, first of all, that which I also received. I received that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. And what he is saying is that he's speaking primarily here, or altogether, of the Old Testament Scriptures. He says, Christ uh, died, was buried, and he rose again. Where am I? Okay, Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. So he says, the Scriptures predicted that Jesus was going to come, the seed of Abraham was going to come, and he was going to die for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. And so what Paul is saying is that the Scriptures cannot be broken. So in our, in our goings and comings, we need to understand the Scriptures cannot be broken. And this day we are testifying here in the service today, we are exalting Jesus Christ who rose from the the dead, and we're saying the Scriptures cannot be broken. We're not false witnesses of God. The Scriptures cannot be broken. That's what we're saying by our uh, presence here today. And he was seen. And Paul tells us who he was seen by. He was seen by Cephas or Peter. Number two, he was seen by the twelve. After that, he was seen by over 500 brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain to the present, but some have fallen asleep. Then verse 7, Paul says, after that he was seen, number 4, by James. By James. He was seen by James, his brother, his, his brother, uh, Joseph and Mary's uh, son. He was seen by James. Th that is so amazing to me. You know, I, I know that there are uh, some who believe that, that Mary remained a virgin the, the uh, her whole life, that's not accurate at all, it's not scriptural, that she did have children, and uh, she had children, and, 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 and God blessed Joseph. You know what I always I, I, I think about sometimes, my mind runs like this, it, is J James and, and Judas and the others of, of, uh, of Jesus' brothers, and his, he had some sisters, can you imagine that forever they could say, that's my brother? Isn't that big? <laughs> But you know something that's big, too? You can say the same. That is big. That is huge. You can say the same because you have been born of the Spirit. That means that God is Spirit. So you have been born of the Spirit of God. So you, too, can say, that's my brother. So when James says, that's my brother, he said, mine, too. <laughs> That's, this is all amazing to me. So let's keep re re reading. And, and after that, he was seen by James. Then, number five, by all the apostles. Then, last of all, he was seen by me also as by one born out of due time. So Paul says, I was born a little late. I was the late baby. And uh, he was seen by me. So Paul gives us six witnesses to the, to the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So, so we're calling up the witnesses. When I'm preaching, and, and we preach around here, we call up our scriptural witnesses because this is what we know, that the Word of God cannot lie. And so we call them to the witness stand, and, and we listen to those witnesses. So Paul says there were six uh, witnesses in this particular passage, and he could have listed the 500 brethren, but he listed them in one group. Are you still with me? And then he, he says in verse 9, For I am the least of the apostles who are, am not worthy to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church. And this is something that Paul uh, I dealt with his whole life in ministry, that he had been a persecutor of the church. He, he dealt with that. But it also, I believe, was one of those factors that drove him to do much more than all the other apostles. This is amazing. And the Holy Spirit let him, let him write it down that he labored more abundantly than all of them. Wow. Isn't it amazing that, you know, without the Holy Spirit, that's like empty boasting, right? It's not, it's not right to boast. You know, yeah, I'm the best preacher in the town, you know, or, or I can sing better than anybody, or, oh, man, you ought to see me play my instrument, you know. No. 
But that wasn't for that. It was, it was talk, he was talking about glorifying the grace of God. And this is what he said. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. It's by the grace of God. It's uh, everything that you and I accomplish, we don't accomplish because we have a genius IQ. We accomplish it by the grace of God. And you and I are here today listening to a message on Resurrection Sunday by the grace of God. We were able to drive here or however we came by the grace of God. It's because God is good, not us. Yes, God is good. So by the grace of God, I am what I am. Listen, now this is what I want all of us to say on this resurrection day. And his grace toward me was not in vain. It was not in vain. It was not a waste. But I labored more abundantly than they all. I labored more abundantly than they all. And listen, listen to this curveball. Yet not I, but the grace of God which was with me. Therefore, whether it was I or they, so we preach and so you believe. Wow, I love that. Now, let, let's explain these uh, again just very quickly. Christ died for our sins is the theological explanation of this historical fact. We must know that this is a historical fact that Jesus raised. Many people were crucified by the Romans, but only one victim ever died for the sins of the world and rose again. Only one. Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. So Paul does not base this on um, uh, of the scriptures on a feeling or a whim, but on the Old Testament scriptures. So I want to read some of that to you from Isaiah 53 because th this is the most uh, one of the most pronounced uh, scriptures. So Isaiah 53 verses 4 through 10. Let's look at Isaiah 53 4 through 10. And we'll read those somewhat quickly, all right? Surely... By the way, before I, I, I get, go from Shirley, this was predictive. This was predictive. And so the Holy Spirit in Isaiah predicted Jesus Christ and what he would go through. And it's amazing how to the, the, the last letter, the stroke of the pen, he carried it out. Let's read. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. We are healed from our sin. Totally. This also applies to physical healing. But this is, we are healed from our sin. We are healed from our wandering away from God. So we are healed. Now listen, verse 6. All we like sheep have gone astray. All. All have sinned and, and come short of the glory of God. All. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. And you and I can't handle a little affliction without opening our mouth. Uh, there's nobody in here who can handle a little affliction, but he opened not his mouth. Well, he had to be somebody special. So he opened not his mouth. He was led as a lamb to the slaughter and as a sheep before his shearers is silent, so he opened not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment and who will declare his generation? For he was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgressions of my people he was stricken and they made his grave with the wicked but with the rich at his death because he had done no violence nor was any deceit in his mouth. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He was put to grief when you make his soul an offering for sin. He was our sin offering. And he was a willing participant, not like an innocent animal. He was a willing pers uh, uh, participant. Peter tells us that there was no deceit in him. Peter, in, in his epistle, there was no deceit in him. Let's, I want to read something else 
and I will, I will uh, quickly go back to uh, our, our text in 1 Corinthians. In Matthew chapter 12, verses 38 through 41, uh, let's read Matthew 12, 38 through 41. It says, Then some of the scribes and Pharisees answered, saying, Teacher, we want to see a sign from you. But he answered and said to them, An evil and adulterous generation seeks after a sign, and no sign will be given to it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. The men of Nineveh will rise up in judgment with this generation and condemn it, because they repented at the preaching of Jonah, and indeed a greater than Jonah is here. A greater than Jonah is here. And this is the reality of the resurrection. Let's look at 1 Corinthians 15, and let's look at verses 22. Let's look at, let's start at verse 22, uh, just, for, just for the sake of this particular reality. It says, for in Adam all die, even so in Christ all shall be made alive. And there are those universalists who, who really misunderstand this particular scripture. They say, in Adam all die, just that so in Christ all shall be made alive. And it doesn't matter what you do, how you live, you will be made alive. But each one in his own order, Christ the first fruits after those who are Christ that is coming. Now that cancels out their belief. He's only coming for those who are Christ's at his coming, those who have been born again. Let's look at 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 12 through how many I get through, okay? Now, if Christ is preached that he has been raised from the dead, Paul is answering this particular um, belief in Corinth that Jesus did not uh, rise from the dead, that nobody rises from the dead. He says, now, if Christ is preached that he has been raised from the dead, how do some among you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? Sometimes with Christians, we have... We have uh, position, doctrinal positions that cannot be proved by the Word of God. And we, we, we accept those because we heard somebody say that. So Paul is refuting these kinds of positions. He says, but if there's no resurrection of the dead, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, then our preaching is empty. And your faith is also empty. Yes, and we are found false witnesses of God, because we have testified of God that he raised up Christ, whom he did not raise up if, in fact, the dead do not rise. So Paul is saying, irrefutably, Christ has been ra risen. He has been raised from the dead. He is risen. In verse 16, he says, For if the dead do not rise, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, your faith is futile, empty, no good. And you're still in your sins. Then also those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. They're finished. They have no hope. They have, they have no expectation of God. They have no trust in God. They're finished. He said, then also, um, if in this life only, if in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most pitiable. If, if in this life only we have an expectation of God through Christ, we ought to be pitied. So what he's saying is that this life is not about you earning the most toys you can earn, getting ahead of everybody you can get ahead of. It's not this life. This life is readying us or getting us ready, preparing us for the next one. This is like as it were, the qualifier. Not that we are qualified by our good works. You see, we are not saved by good works. We are saved for good works. So good works should follow you. They should, they should be in your wake. Wherever you are, there are good works there. This is what Paul is, is getting over to them. Now, I'll, I'm going to kind of wrap up very quickly here. Verse 20, he says, but now Christ is risen from the dead. And, and Paul knows because of what? The scriptures. He's not even gotten into his own testimony. He was on his way to Damascus, and he met the risen Christ. 
He did not know the Jesus, the physical Jesus, the Jesus that walked the earth, but he met the risen Christ. He had evidence. He says, but now Christ is risen from the dead and has become the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since by man came death, by man also came the resurrection from the dead. For as in Adam, and I love the way he goes back to the scriptures, to the holy scriptures that cannot be broken. If you have doubts or fears or concerns, go to the word of God because there is where your answer lie. Amen. Now this is what he says. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ all shall be made alive. And that, then the universalists also make a big mistake there. They say, you see, it says all are made alive. But all who are in Christ shall be made alive. That's the, the inference here. That's what he's talking about. When Jesus rose from the dead on that third day, got out of the grave, that was a message to everybody who is in Christ. That's why we implore people, be born again. Come to Jesus. That's why we do that. The first Adam led mankind into death through sin. The last Adam led, not the second Adam, the last Adam uh, leads us out of death through righteousness. The first one led us into death through sin. The soul that sins shall die. But the last one led us out through righteousness. And I'm going to stop here and just put a little comma there. But let me just say that Jesus Christ now gives us the gift of righteousness. This is how it happens. You and I go to God the Father and we say, Lord, God, I believe that Jesus is your son. Forgive me of all of my wrong." And God says, that's all I require of you, to admit that you were wrong and accept my son. And listen, this is amazing. And I'll give you eternal life. He didn't say, I'll give you an, a, a, an opportunity for eternal life. I will give you eternal life. And that's what this day is about, everybody. Don't live life on your own. Don't live life on your own. Don't live life by your rules. L live life by the scriptures, the holy scriptures. Now I'm going to come back in a little bit and I'm going to ask if anybody who heard this message, I want you to contemplate, just think about it. If you're not saved today, don't run the risk of being eternally lost. I want to be pretty bold here in this statement. God is offering you everything all he asks you to do is admit that you're wrong and, and accept Jesus as his son, as his sin cure. That's all he asks. And he'll give you everything for that. I'm going to come back after a while and we're going to ask you to receive him. Sister Stephanie.
appropriate song. And what we're going to do before we, we uh, receive communion, I, I want to ask if there's anybody here that you said, I've heard you preaching, and I've heard the offer of salvation, and I want to give my heart to Jesus. To me, that's the best offer you're going to ever get. Some of you are shoppers, and you like a good deal. You want to go down there and, and see that $500 shirt for $50. You, you want to buy that $1,000 suit, and you only want to pay $200. This is much better. You and I were born wrong. What I'm saying is we were born with sin. That little sweet baby with all that Johnson baby powder on him, smelling so good and laughing and just thinking you the best thing in the world, they were born a sinner. And they need salvation. And, and God the Father is offering you and I, salvation. It's hard for me to fathom that. That God is saying, Don, all you have to do is say, I'm wrong. You know you're wrong. You look in the mirror, you know you're wrong. You know you just accused that person and they didn't done anything. You know you just had a big argument with your, your wife or your husband. You know you can't stand your best friend anymore. You know you're always having issues and problems. You know you're wrong. Just admit it. And then accept Jesus, my son. If that's you today, would you mind just raising your hand and saying, I want to give thank you so much. Is there anybody else? Come on, let's, let's just do it. We don't have to worry about the time. Let's do it. Yes, okay, yes, there's somebody else. Is there somebody else? Yes. Come on. Tell you what, you go bring him over, Nate. Over there, young, oh, way over yonder. Yes, come, come. Let, let's, let's, let's just come and let's talk. Is there anybody else, anybody? I mean, you know, we all have to do it. You know, this is the way we all come. We all come. And I would never do anything to embarrass you, not intentionally. But let's just do this. And see, the best thing, the best thing is that you and I would just come to God and we say, look, I'm wrong. Everybody here has, has had to do that. Everybody. And if, it, if there's somebody here who has not said that to God, they're not saved. It's just straight up. God, I'm wrong. That's what I said. And I need Jesus to help me. And I need Jesus to help me. And that's what that looks like, all right? So we're not going to wait any further. I thought, were, were you bringing the person or no? They prefer to stay? Yeah, man. I sent you over at a strong army. <laughs> not really, brother. Yeah, come on over. Come on over. It's a good thing. This is a good thing. Let's make them feel comfortable. Come on. Let's make them feel comfortable. I'm so glad for you, man. I'm so glad for you. Okay, okay. anybody else? It's, it's just like I was preaching, and you know, Don Lavelle has tried to get away from Don Lavelle a long time. I mean, spent 75 years trying to get away from him and wondering why in the world does a man who want to do right do, does wrong sometimes. I mean, I, I, I've been like that. A guy who is known for being a cool head, why does he sometimes want to be hot-headed? You know, the, the guy who's fair with, with people, weren't really wanting to be fair. Why am I sometimes unfair? Some, why does sometimes I want to pay them back, you know? I can't wait on God's justice. I need a Savior. That's what that means. I need a Savior. And my Savior helps me when I'm weak. He helps me when I'm weak. And I said, I'm so grateful to Jesus that I didn't die at 74 because I learned a lot in that last year. See, he's just, he continuously 
continuously teaches us. He's perfect. He gives us a new heart that is perfect. But I have an old heart there too. And I know where it is. And sometimes I say things I don't want to say. And I ask him to forgive me and he forgives me. And it's like when he forgives me, it's like he doesn't keep reminding me of it. The enemy, Satan, he wants to say, ah, you're no good. Remember that time you messed up? Satan is always saying, when that happens, it's not Jesus. It's the devil. So but you, you don't have to listen to him because he didn't save you. He's the one who messed it up for us. So let's just repent. And I'm going to help you repent by saying, just giving you some words to say. And then you can also say uh, other words to Jesus later. Just say, Heavenly Father, I come to you because I need a Savior. I ask you to forgive me of all of my sins. I confess that I am a sinner and I need a Savior. Please come into my heart today. Accept my words. Give me a pardon. Forgive me. And I will serve you, Lord, all the days of my life. Thank you for saving me. Somebody may say, that's too easy. That's what God told Abraham. The Bible says Abraham believed God and it was put on the books as righteousness. He didn't work. Because if you had to work to be saved, that means God owed you something. But God doesn't owe us anything. And so today, right now, God has saved you. According to the scriptures, God has saved you. That means that you're his forever and ever and ever and ever. Amen. Thank you so much. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. We want to give that to you. Bless you. Amen. Amen. All right. I think it was worth that, don't you? You know, the Bible teaches us that on the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took bread and he broke it. And he said to his disciples, take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Some versions say which was broken for you. Not that Jesus' body was broken, but it was disseminated given to them not a bone was broken because he's the perfect sacrifice but I want you to take this bread and just remember this resurrection day I didn't get into my my uh, Easter refutation this is too sacred too holy to be called Easter it's not an Easter it's not about a bunny it's about a savior it's not about chickens and eggs and and Easter egg hunts, it's about a Savior who gave his life for us. And you and I are now witnesses of God through Christ. We are witnesses because of the Holy Spirit. And right before you take the bread and eat, because Jesus says that my flesh is food indeed. He says, in other words, he was giving himself for us so that we would live forever, eternally. But I want you, before you take the bread, I would like for you to just tell Jesus you love him and just tell him you love him and that you, you, you'll see him soon, you know, in maybe, maybe 10 years, maybe 100 years, but you're going to see him and you're going to be with him forever. Just love on him just a moment and, and then we'll eat together. Thank you, Jesus. We love you on this day. Thank you, Jesus. Let us eat together. This symbolizes that we have received Jesus. That's what this bread, eating this bread symbolizes that we have actually received Jesus and that now he is our strength, he is our life. Let's take our cup. You can open it. Your bread was at the bottom. You saw that? And now let's take our cup. Jesus said to uh, his followers that his blood was drink drink indeed and he said that they should drink from the cup 
because it shows that we have applied the blood to our lives. We have applied the blood. We don't drink blood. Some of the Jews had real problem with that, with him talking like that. And the Bible said they left him and wouldn't follow him anymore. You know why? They were just too stinking religious. Just religious. They reeked with religious and didn't know the, the reality of their Bible or, or their, their scriptures. They didn't know the reality. Jesus was not saying that you and I should drink literal blood. Jesus was saying, my blood is effective for your salvation. And it, and it is effective because I know I'm saved. And I want you to say the same things. I know I'm saved. Each, each of you to say that. Why? Because of the effectiveness of the blood. And so when we drink this, we're saying we have applied that blood. We've accepted that blood. Let us drink. Wow. Wow. Thank you, Jesus. Well, we, are, we so appreciate you. You may continue to stand. Those of you who are standing, you may continue to stand, and we're going to dismiss you. Thank you so much for being here today. We bless you so much. Thank you so much. And what we do here at the fellowship, those of you who are new to us, what we do is we lift our hands and we bless each other as we go. Some people may say, well, why do you do that? Well, uh, the, the Lord commanded Moses to bless the people. And so we just want to bless our brothers and sisters. So let, and, and if you can, let's do a, like a 360 or, or you can do it like a half moon, those of you who are there. You know, and, and so we're going to do, I'll do a 360 up here. But let's uh, repeat after me. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you. The Lord be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you. And the Lord give you his peace. In Jesus' name, I bless you. Okay, happy Resurrection Day. Bye-bye. God bless you all. We love you. Have a great day. Be safe. Los amamos.